It is said that generals are faulted for fighting the last war. I think this is true of today's political journalism and analysis. They document the rise of U.S. authoritarianism in terms of a century ago and are ignoring the evolution of today's variant. The 1920s was a reaction to worker organization, which did not target the modern state or democracy per se. Today's conservatism, in contrast, is more fundamental. Now we've got a movement being run by extraordinarily wealthy people, uh, what I refer to as the morbidly rich, trying to basically reduce democracy in the United States. So why would, why would the morbidly rich and their personal you know, foundations and the corporations that made them rich, why would they be throwing money into efforts to reduce democracy in the United States? There's actually a fascinating backstory here. It goes back to 1951. In 1951, Russell Kirk, who was a, you know, kind of a well-known conservative uh, gadfly thinker, published a book called The Conservative Mind. In that book, and, and probably more importantly and more explicitly in many of the writings about and around that book, particularly by people like William F. Buckley, uh, who argued in print in National Review that, you know, whites should continue to control the United States because blacks are inferior, it literally said that. Um, but around that book and that time in the early 50s was this theory among Republicans, among conservatives, that the growing middle class at that point in time was a danger to American democracy. The American middle class in 1951 was growing faster than any middle class had ever grown in the history of the world. By that point, 1951, about half of us were in the middle class. That had never happened before in any country. And Kirk and others around him, uh, particularly Buckley, predicted that if the middle class continued to grow, we would hit a point where the average working person would have enough wealth that they would have the leisure time to engage in politics, which had traditionally been the support of the rich. And that once the average American started getting politically active, it would produce chaos. We would be, there would be riots in the streets, the country would be on fire, the, the proletariat would rise up and demand that the, 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 the rich be taxed to death and all that money be redistributed, and that would be the end of society, the end of democracy, the end of America. They reject wholly the Enlightenment. As a bonus, it also is wholly ignorant of how and why they arose. Russell Kirk's and Buckley's assertions are, at best, misinformed. These assumptions were also held by conservative economists like Milton Freeman, or more particularly, James McGill Buchanan. It is their collective folly. The history of Europe is replete with past centuries of social and economic strife and instability, religious and international war, rise and fall of nations is its common feature. It was freedom from this condition in Europe that distinguished the U.S. early in its history and was the rationale for emigrating to it. On top of this, the U.S. itself was a product of the cultural experience of centuries of war in Europe. A small sample of European history will make this point. For instance, the bloody conflicts of the 16th and 17th centuries. These are the centuries that surrounded the Reformation and the Thirty Years' War that capped that period. 
The experience was so fun that it inspired the development of what we consider the modern state. This is a state of laws and of government secularism. This is the form of government modern conservatives reject. If we push a little further back in time, we can look to the formation of Christian orthodoxy, built on persecution and the extinction of any diversity within the faith. All this so we could enjoy, over the centuries, everything from the Crusades to the Reformation. Are you feeling that stability love yet? Which is, of course, to say that the fundamental assumptions made by Kirk and Buckley and others are actually wrong. And the cherry on top of all this ignorance is that the source of conflict and ruin was most often the nobility itself. Their own short-sightedness, greed, and vanity. There is this story you probably heard if you were an English school kid, of the English barons ruled by the incompetent King John, who forced the king into signing the Magna Carta. And this document, a concession by the king to the rights of the barons, supposedly formed the foundation from which English democracy and Anglo-American democracy in general was born. The Magna Carta holds an almost mythical and sacred position within the English-speaking political consciousness, the supposed foundation from which English liberty was unleashed upon the world and Britain came to prosper. There is, however, a problem with this narrative. Seven years after the signing of the Magna Carta, in 1222, King Andras II of Hungary was forced to sign the Golden Bull. The Golden Bull is sometimes called the Magna Carta of Eastern Europe, but it was far more extensive in the rights and privileges that it entitled the Hungarian aristocracy to. Hungary and England basically had the same starting position in political development. But, in the coming centuries, there was no Hungarian democracy and no ideal of Hungarian liberty that evolved from the Golden Bull. Instead, the Kingdom of Hungary decayed, lost power and influence, and was eventually conquered by the Ottomans. Although Hungary was a centralized kingdom in name, it was basically reduced to little more than a confederacy of oligarchic barons by the 14th century. Then came the Turks. With the advancing of the Ottomans into the Balkans during the 15th century, the Hungarian state briefly rebounded. Janos Hulyandi, an aristocratic military leader, was made regent of the state, raised taxes and formed what became known as the Black Army, which inflicted several defeats on the Ottomans, even kicking them out of Serbia at one point. All of its successes, rather than cementing the necessity of a centralized state, the Hungarian aristocracy resented and hated the Black Army. They hated its successes, they hated its commander, they hated the fact that they had to pay taxes for it, and they resented that they had to give up their their own military privileges. They hated the centralized government structures needed to sustain it. So, by 1490, they called a parliament and voted to reinstate their own military privileges. They cut the funds and provisions of the Black Army, placed the puppet boy king on the throne, and to add a cherry on top, they cut the taxes levied on them by 80%. Four years later, the Ottomans invaded Hungary, crushed what was left of the Black Army, killed the boy king, and conquered all of Hungary. The Hungarian aristocratic oligarchy basically destroyed their own country for a tax cut. Ah, arrogance and stupidity all in the same package. How efficient of you. This is America. I highly recommend watching Kraut's Folly of Liberal History for all the other little tidbits that he offers up, because it's edifying, to say the least. Do it. The rich are just as prone to folly as any of us, but it is their power that allows them to inflict it on everyone around them. Now, when Kirk published that in 1951, there was only a small number of conservatives who took him seriously. They thought he was a crackpot. I mean, Barry Goldwater loved it. William F. Buckley loved it. But Dwight Eisenhower in 1954 said of Kirk, not specifically, but of the billionaires who were funding him, actually, the Hunt brothers, he said, or, or supporting him, he said, you know, the, their numbers are small and they are stupid. 
That was in 54. But then came the 1960s and the passage, or 68, and the passage of the uh, Voting Rights Act and Civil Rights Acts in 64 and 65. Uh, I've got the order backwards, but you know what I'm talking about. And so by the end of the 60s, in addition to those things, the, there were a number of high-profile police killings of unarmed black people that then provoked riots, and so you had cities on fire. So you had women burning their bras, or at least that, you know, the, that was the media narrative. You had black people burning cities. You had the war in Vietnam by 1967. You had students burning draft cards. I mean, this was, the, at that point, you know, the conservatives, at, oh, and the labor, union, the labor movement was in full, you know, full swing. Uh, 1970 was the peak, 5,716 strikes in that one year, over 3 million workers walked out in 1970. And as that ha happened, these, these four things happened, these four movements all happened in the 60s. Conservatives looked back at what Russell Kirk had written and said, my God, this guy was a prophet. The country is in flames. The, the, the young people are rebelling. The women and minorities no longer know their place, for God's sake. We've got to do something. It's a bit breathtaking to digest the reality of the last half century. Corporations and their owners have spent a couple of billion dollars over that half century to reshape a republic into a plutocracy. And they have spawned an entire industry to spread this ideology, one entirely bereft of Western history and bound to Repeat it. It is an ideology that brings horror and national ruin to anything it touches. We can see this in recent history. Worse, they have made it into their culture, their ideology, buttressed by the full force of money and influence they can generate. This mad plutocratic cult of contempt will not burn out on its own. It must be refuted socially. For example, dumping Trump or DeSantis won't end this. It won't end the perversity of the GOP. Not while billionaires feed it with hundreds of millions of dollars each year expended on shaping policy, funding the GOP, choosing the judiciary, and molding public opinion every day via Fox, Turning Points USA, PragerU, Daily Wire, Crowder, Twitter, and many more, and with the standard media normalizing the growing despotism. Everyone has a stake in refuting and mocking the folly of this vain spite and contempt. It must be refuted in the street, in our schools, in our homes, in our shops, factories, hospitals, in economics, in academia, in legislatures, from the pulpit, and in media. We can't surrender to the chaos of their despotism even should they subjugate or starve us, because in the end, that is the fate they intend for us, whether they understand that or not. 